uh, said a little bit about yourself. Maybe I should have done that. But no, no. I there's a story it. that you... I yeah. Think. It kind of folds into the presentation. And so. as I said, I've known Bob for a long time. And we've done a bunch of stuff together. Yeah. Actually, Hassan is part of this biographical story, I'd say. Um, I had uh, a, a funny thing happen to me after I graduated from uh, architecture school. Um, as is often the case with um, architecture and recessions. Mm -hmm. um, I was working quite happily, first in New York and then in, um, in San Francisco when uh, the recession hit. And um, I was fortunate enough to also be nurturing an interest in uh, urban space uh, in relationship to culture, you know, different why in the United States do we have this automobile dependent suburban object building arrangement of the world? And I was most interested in Rome uh, and the Noli map. Have you seen the Noli map of Rome? And how uh, instead of the building being the thing uh, in Rome, and especially as represented in the Noli map, uh, the space is the thing. And so I was very interested in the space as the thing, so much so that um, while I was in architecture school, I learned Italian and looked, started looking at grants, possibilities, so I could go to Rome and study it. Well, the weird thing happened. Um, my girlfriend, uh, she was a pianist, a lifelong commitment, five hours a day of practicing. She came home one day and just said, no, we're done no more piano. And she didn't know what to do with herself, so she started looking at Japanese and uh, African drumming, Japanese shakuachi. She ended up started playing uh, the Javanese gamelan. And uh, she went off to Indonesia, and she brought back this photo. Um, I don't know, is the lighting? I, I could turn the light off. No, this is good. I can see faces. It's good to see faces. Do you, yeah. do you want to see the images better? or Up to you. It's, okay. it's fine. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Is this all right? Or do you, is that better? I mean, do you want to see the faces? Uh, <laughs> I'm going to... I'm, I'm working really hard at the end of the semester, and I don't know about you guys, but I fall asleep. Uh, <laughs> while it's, I'm, you don't want me to fall asleep while I'm presenting. Thank you. So um, this is the photo that um, got me, uh, got my juices flowing. And uh, there's this very dense urban fabric. And then, uh, and then this gate building. So it's a building as a gate. And then beyond the door is this tantalizing hint of gardens in this other world. And she described it. And you know, she's not an architect. So I said, oh, that sounds interesting. So I did what any normal person would do. I'm um, just kidding. Um, I learned Indonesian, <laughs> applied for a grant, uh, and went off to Indonesia. In the meantime, uh, we broke up. Um, and um, that was that. And, uh, but I ended up there anyway. There's nothing that was going to stop me. And um, I arrived, uh, and I came to this gate. I knew nothing. I, I tried my best to find out whatever I could about Indonesia and Javanese architecture. This is in the, the, on the island of Java. And there was really nothing uh, that I could find. This was pre-internet, believe it or not, in the back, what was it called, the 20th century? <laughs> and um, so I showed up uh, from the airport uh, at this gate, went through the gate. And it turns out they rent rooms for the night. And so I stayed inside the gate. And um, it was a horrible, dirty, uh, infested place. Calls to prayer in the middle of the night, um, waking me up. I was uh, thrilled. Um, so in the morning, I, I, I came out and um, started talking to people, because I'd learned enough Indonesian to talk to people. They didn't speak any English at all. Um, and they said, yeah, this is uh, an old palace uh, replica. It's, it's a small version of the palace. And I said, palace? 
And they said, yeah, yeah, there's a palace. And um, they said, uh, and I said, where is it? Well, they said, just go out, go around the corner and keep turning right and it's right there. You'll find it to the, right, to the front gate. Um, little background, India, China, the Philippines, uh, Vietnam, and then the place nobody knows about, which is uh, Indonesia. It's, some of it's unfortunately covered up here because of, I don't know how to get rid of this little bar. Um, there it goes. So the red, uh, even though we've never, who's heard of Indonesia? Wow. Oh. Is that because of you? No. <laughs> um, what have you heard? I think they're one of the largest contributors to like off gassing and like CO2. Yeah. Like, for they, palm oil. Yes, they cut down all the rainforest on the island of Borneo, uh, and it's uh, a big problem. What else do you know about Indonesia? My sister was in a meeting and for the pharmaceutical industry and, and um, they were saying, they were distinguishing between major markets, China, India, Europe, and minor markets. And uh, in the minor market uh, for small countries, they said Indonesia. And she said, no, that's a major market. And they just scoffed at her. And um, she said, look it up. And um, later they apologized to her. Turns out, who knew? Indonesia is the fourth largest country in the world by population. Um, turns out that half the population of the world, humans, live uh, in this area shown in the slide. The greatest density is shown in the red. And um, in India, China, especially around the river valleys, and when this goes away, the island of Java, uh, about the size of California, um, and home to about uh, 170 million people. Is that right? I can't remember. A lot of people. And the reason there's so many people there, uh, and have been so many people there for thousands of years, uh, uh, or because there are so many people there, it's a major center of civilization as seen in the world's largest Buddhist um, uh, stupa, Borobudur. Which we did look at uh, right at the beginning. But Excellent. Probably all forgotten. Borobudur, the Buddhist, largest Buddhist um, uh, stupa in the world, and uh, a Hindu uh, temple uh, not far from the Buddhist stupa, all right in the center of Java, which is fed by a constant flow of um, renewal of volcanic ash um, because it's on the ring of fire, very active volcanoes still. Um, right before this eruption, I was hiking at the top of there, and um, this happened two weeks later. Um, so I'm glad I missed that, um, except to see it from afar. So I went around the corner, uh, and there was this kind of rundown building, and there were all these people coming in and out. And I said, who are these people? And the guard there said, oh, princes, and uh, that's the prince. And I said, prince? There's a prince? And they said, yeah, there are 36 princes and princesses. And I was, I was just, I had no idea. And, and they said, I said, is there a king? I said, yeah, king. And six wives, and it's still going. Turns out that there's this king uh, in, a, in a palace uh, called the Kraton Surakarta, and it's uh, been, it's the um, inheritor of, this palace is a tradition that started over a thousand years ago, um, and uh, was very much uh, the government of uh, the island of Java, and then the Dutch came um, in the early 17th century, and uh, in the interest of trade and colonial um, exchange, 
they dominated the island through trade and then through outright um, military control. And the Javanese strategy to survive throughout, from, from the beginning, was deference. They would say, they would identify the enemy as either being, uh, or the adversary as either being more powerful or less powerful. If less powerful, just um, defeat them militarily. But if the adversary is more powerful, then you defer to them and you welcome them in. And so they welcomed the Dutch. They um, gave the governor general of the Dutch colonial um, uh, official hierarchy, they gave him official title in the palace so that the storyline could remain unbroken. This was a strategy of deference that would allow them to say, yes, uh, in the 17th century, we were reunited with our long lost brothers, uh, the Dutch, and we recognized their title in the hierarchy of the ongoing palace tradition. And so that's what they did. You see the king of Siam, um, who's performing a similar trick of partial assimilation of uh, European customs through the dress. And then you see the king here who is decked out in full Dutch um, costume with the medals and the sash. Um, and then you see the architecture surrounding. You see hints of an embrace of the Baroque uh, colonial uh, styles. And then you see a few traces of um, remaining elements that are mixed in together. So here's the king that I uh, met during my three-month uh, research grant. Uh, and based on conversations with him and his son uh, and getting to know uh, what was happening at the palace, uh, I was able to stretch my three-month grant to a year and a half. And then um, I was able to uh, raise money from donors uh, and stretched it to four years. And I became the uh, preservation architect for the palace. Um, I kind of created this job uh, just by asking questions. Why are the buildings so run down? Uh, what is it with all of these ceremonies? And more, most pointedly of all, why is it that the local university is insisting that the way to, to preserve the palace is to kick out the royal family and hire actors to pretend that they are the royal family as a strategy for attracting tourists? Why is that plan A for preservation? Um, and so the context of this is so far you get this sense that it's a very traditional uh, place, but here, here you see someone in a very traditional costume, which is a combination of European and uh, Javanese elements. You see this tower, which is dedicated to the queen of the, the mythical deity, the queen of the South Seas, but it looks very Dutch. Um, and you see cars, and there's the wheel of a motorbike, and you see this very interesting uh, bicycle taxi. The city of uh, Solo, which is where the Kraton Surakarta is located, uh, is a bustling Asian metropolis with, uh, where its bicycles at the time were being replaced by motorbikes and the motorbikes were being replaced by cars. Um, it's a very interesting place. There's a, a Dutch era railway that runs east-west that connects um, Surakarta, also known as Solo, with the rest of uh, Java. And then there's an, so that's the east-west axis of rail and road transportation infrastructure. Then there's a north-south religious axis that passes through the palace here. There is a secondary palace over here that was split off from the original palace. Um, originally, there would have been wars of succession. And when a prince would secede from the palace, um, there would be a, a skirmish, um, and the winner would become the new king. Um, but under Dutch colonial rule, the Dutch military uh, controlled the degree of skirmishes, and they established a fortress up here 
to uh, control things. Let's see. Um, and so uh, every time there was a split, the prince who split off would become a ruler of a, of a smaller part. So the one kingdom has split twice. Um, and so now there are four houses, of which this is the original palace. Um, and so I was confronted early on with uh, a, a familiar story of there's this old stuff going on, but of course it will be all replaced and swept away into the ash heap of history as uh, Indonesia modernizes. And that was the assumption that I brought with me, and it's the assumption that a lot of people around me portrayed, including the prince, the main prince who I was working with at the palace. He was perfectly happy to allow me to believe that everyone around wa had a certain uh, casual and uh, comfortable comfort level with the fact that, yeah, when this king dies, uh, it'll all be over. And sure, why not become a tourist attraction? Um, but I started to ask questions as I started to see what was going on. Uh, the first thing I saw was this uh, ritual cleansing of the sacred canon. And I said, sacred canon? You know, uh, constantly questioning what is going on here. And yeah, sacred canon, it's in this glass pavilion with shrouds. Only the king himself and this one priest are allowed to even see the sacred canon. And, um, and so here's the priest cleaning the sacred canon. Uh, the water comes off the canon, and then the, the building, the pavilion, the glass pavilion is cleaned. Then uh, the floor is cleaned, and those water gets swept. The columns are cleaned. The water gets swept off the platform to a throng of women uh, and children waiting to collect the water because this wastewater that we would flush down the drain as quickly as possible is precious uh, because it came off the sacred canon. So at this point, I'm starting to ask the question, if they're wringing every last drop out of the rags to collect it into their cans, there's more to the story than this inevitable disappearance of tradition. Uh, the next ceremony I was looking, I was looking at the architecture and I was trying to figure out why are the mosques um, shaped the way they are. The reason they are is because when Islam came to uh, Java, in the, first in the 12th century, but really more seriously in the 14th century, uh, Islam took on the cultural uh, norms of the societies where it came to take root. And the sacred buildings of Java were based on the Hindu architectural practices of an odd numbered of pyramidal shaped roofs stacked up on each other. And uh, those things exist to the present in, in Bali. Um, and so it became the classic uh, architectural form of the mosque, uh, first in Java and then throughout Southeast Asia. It became the indigenous interpretation of Islamic architecture with four central sacred columns uh, and three tiered <coughs> roofs. It was environmentally sensitive in that it uh, allowed for ventilation um, and light uh, and very rich and interesting architectural form. Uh, and here's the uh, Javanese mosque form at the palace uh, in Surakarta. Uh, which is part of the palace complex. Interestingly, these are the, uh, <clears throat> for the celebration of Qurabeg Maulud, uh, which is an Islamic, there are three major Islamic holidays uh, celebrated in Java over the course of the, the year. Uh, and this is one of the Islamic holidays, um, high holy days, and it's celebrated in this palace through the use of Hindu symbols, the linga and yoni. Do you, who knows about Hinduism? What is linga and yoni? What are they symbols of? Can I like take a guess? Sure. Like, like light and dark, like yin and yang kind of ideas? Yin and yang. Um, anyone else? 
it's actually uh, it's light and dark. It's opposites. It's yin and yang. It's the two um, uh, original forces in the universe. Um, more graphically, it's male and female genitalia. Uh, and so it's odd that um, representations of the linga and yoni of the Hindu religious tradition would be the central objects of focus for an Islamic holiday. Um, but it is. In, in Java, this is uh, another a demonstration of how when new forces arrive on the scene, they don't sweep away what came before. They embrace, um, they, they take stock of who they are and what they've always done, and then they assimilate, uh, they incorporate, they embrace these foreign elements and work to weave them into the traditions that they uh, have been practicing for centuries. And so thus is the case. Um, originally, the Javanese worshipped the Queen of the South Seas. Uh, and then they came under the influence about 2,000 years ago with trade with India and China. They came to embrace uh, Hinduism and Buddhism and incorporated in with their pre-existing traditions of the Queen of the South Seas. Then Islam came. And again, they assimilated through the architecture and through these rituals, uh, those practices, uh, the anthropology department here at Roger Williams would call that uh, syncretism. Has anyone taken an anthropology class? I don't remember that. I don't remember that term. <laughs> well, okay, now you will. So, syncretism is the uh, weaving together of traditions, uh, and in the Javanese language. Syncretic. I've read, yeah, syncretic. I've read a paper about that before. It might have been the one you read for this class. No. That I wrote. No, I wrote a paper. No, we didn't read that. Just okay. read your article. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so here it is. Um, uh, syncretically part uh, of the traditional life of um, the practices of this palace. Here the um, the two offerings are presented at the mosque. Uh, and um, once the essence has been presented uh, at the mosque, the crowd, uh, similar to the, the uh, collection of the water, the crowd uh, breaks ranks and they scramble to uh, tear these things to shred and get the rice cakes and the flowers and the fruit. And they take it home because when people are sick or when uh, there are pests on their rice fields or when something bad happens to their mother-in-law, um, they, they do something with these items. They, they put it in the rice fields. They feed it to their children. Uh, they take action to remedy the imbalance um, that has obviously been the source of this. So all the while, I'm, I'm getting more and more familiar with these very much alive beliefs and practices of the people, my friends at the local university are developing a tourism uh, preservation plan for the palace. And I was shocked uh, to find these photos in their tourism plan because um, as I grew more and more trusted uh, by the king and his, uh, his people, uh, they gave me more and more access to different forbidden areas of the palace. But one area I was never, there were two areas I was never granted access to. Uh, and this is one of them. This is uh, the Kaputren, uh, which is the equivalent of a harem. So the six wives and the, the small children of the king live here. When the boys reach puberty, they have to move out. Um, and Outsiders are just never let in. But here it is uh, in this page of the, um, uh, let me translate it. It's the um, development study for the tourist, cultural tourism uh, plan for the palace, the uh, Surakarta Palace. 
the Kraton Surakarta Palace. So the plan here reads that uh, the plan is to make this a hotel. Um, and uh, here's the very logical, scientific flowchart that uh, justifies uh, converting this holy place into a uh, tourist attraction. Um, and my biggest shock was that it was all based on uh, their careful study of uh, Colonial Williamsburg. They asked the question, what is the state of the art? What should we do? And their answer was, the United States. They, they do everything best. And so they said, where in the United States are they best at historic preservation? And the answer was, Colonial Williamsburg. <laughs> and so I came along, and they expected me to be all excited as an American. Um, I, you know, I'm supposed to love Colonial Williamsburg, and they were asking me about Colonial Williamsburg, and I was saying, what are you doing? <laughs> if there had been descendants of the original colonists in Colonial Williamsburg, if they were continuing many aspects of their original lifestyle, farming, churning butter, um, like an Amish, if they were like an Amish-like community still practicing some of the things, even if they had cell phones and cars in addition, if they were keeping going any aspect in continuity with the original settlers, that would be the most valuable thing about Colonial Williamsburg. Um, it does not make sense for you to kill the living culture of the palace in order to resuscitate it after the f fact uh, of its death, as we did in Colonial Williamsburg. Um, at the same time I was saying this, uh, three of the princesses went on a hunger strike. And they said, we refuse to leave, and uh, we object to this plan. Uh, and so that was an opportunity for me to propose an alternative plan. Um, and so I got to work and uh, studying the buildings and trying to develop uh, an alternative plan. So um, around the same time, an artist showed up. And based on the research we were doing, uh, he produced this artistic rendering of the palace complex. And I learned more and more about the, um, the traditions of the palace. And one of the uh, things that informed the actual nature of the rituals is that the palace itself, the buildings, you may have noticed, there's nothing really palatial. There's no gold leaf. There's no uh, great stonework, great sculpture. It's a kind of a rundown uh, wood building. Uh, and the more I looked into it, the more I came to learn that it's not so much the buildings themselves, although some buildings are considered extremely sacred, uh, but that has less to do with its material opulence, the way we would consider it in the West uh, an object of preservation attention. But it was the complex itself and the planning of the complex. And so um, it's hard. Uh, to the right, I try to keep the orientation of all these images uh, the same. To the right, there's a great field. You can see just a corner of the field. And you can see the mosque in the background. There's the mosque. Here's the great uh, square, the town square. And here's the central axis running through the center of the palace. Here's the tower uh, dedicated to the Queen of the South Seas. Here's the harem. Um, even at the time, this was even considered, I had to ask permission to draw the harem from the air pre-Google Earth. Uh, one of the reasons I stayed is I was walking down a hallway and I saw something out of the corner of my eyes. I passed an office. It was an aerial photograph on the wall. And I did a double take. I went back and I said, is that the palace? And they said, yeah, that's the palace. How did you know? And that was my introduction to the team who was producing the preservation study a la Colonial Williamsburg. Um, and then there's another town square open field to the south. So there's a symmetry to the arrangement of buildings and courtyards along this ceremonial axis. Here's the more recent Google Earth view. Here's the large town square to the north. North is to the right. I'm trying to keep it that way. 
Here's the large town square to the south. Here's the central axis cutting through the center. There's the mosque. Um, and it turns out the palace complex is a model of the Hindu Javanese uh, conception of the universe. So the palace itself serves as a cosmological model uh, for the cosmos. And this is one view of it. It's at the center, there is an island uh, with a mountain where the gods uh, preside. And that central mountain sits on an island. And that island is surrounded by an ocean, which takes the shape of a ring. And around that ocean is a piece of land which is another ring. And then outside that piece of land is another ocean. And so it's a concentric set of concentric rings of land and oceans. They call them continents and oceans. And here's another representation of it where it t starts to take on a square form. Uh, and so the gods preside at the middle at the sacred mountain Meru. Uh, and that mountain sits on the island, and the island is surrounded by rings of oceans and continents. Um, here's in my notes, trying to figure this out. Uh, here's another representation of it in plan and in section. The mountain, ocean, continent, ocean, continent. Uh, here's my diagram in my notes. And it turns out that this ring arrangement maps directly onto the arrangement of the palace. And so we see that in a series of drawings that then lead to this overlay of the, the cosmological model on top of the actual uh, plan of the palace that was produced by my, my hardworking team. And so here it is uh, juxtaposed. So there's the mosque, there's the town square to the north, the uh, sacred axis that cuts through the center. Uh, and right at the center are the most sacred buildings of the palace because uh, the belief goes that this is not just a model. It's not just a symbolic representation of the universe. It is an actual instrument for controlling the flow of good fortune between heaven and earth. So it turns out that the good fortune flows from heaven to earth through uh, the equivalent of an umbilical cord into uh, the navel of the world, which is this building right here at the center. And that good fortune flows out in a series of concentric circles outward through to the outer edges of the palace, to the outer edges of the city, to the outer edges of the island of Java, and then to the rest of the world. And so the Javanese are endowed with an unshakable confidence that they are at the center of the world. Why not? Um, the first president of Indonesia took the Greenwich meridian of zero degrees, and he moved it to the capital in Jakarta and said, this is the real zero. And he renamed the Indian Ocean the Indonesian Ocean. And so that confidence of the Javanese uh, place at the center of the universe as the most superior civilization on the planet um, uh, was very strong, uh, remains very strong. Uh, and so, uh, and this manifests in the palace in very interesting ways. Uh, every time you pass through one of these gates, you're supposed to examine your outer and your inner state and determine whether it is you are in a sufficiently uh, balanced state of mind and body to enter through the gate, to rise up to the hierarchy as you approach the center, to the point where these last few gates have mirrors to the right and to the left. And to the right, you examine your outward appearance, and then you turn to your left, and in that mirror, you examine your inward appearance. And if you pass the test, then you proceed. If you don't, you shouldn't go in. It manifests, uh, so it manifests architecturally through these thresholds. It manifests in terms of language. People who live at the north and south coast of Java are not expected to 
be able to speak high Javanese because only people near the center would ever need to speak high Javanese. Uh, if you don't live near the center of these sacred forces, no need. Uh, but as you get closer and closer to the center of the palace, your language is expected to change. You go from low Javanese, which is for making dirty jokes on the streets, which you can do outside the palace, to middle Javanese, which is more respectful, to high Javanese, uh, which is extremely uh, respectful. Uh, the story that anthropologists tell is that when their children in Solo, in this city, are, are arguing with each other, they're fighting too much, their parents forbid them from speaking anything but high Javanese to their siblings. And because the language is the way it is, it's so polite, it's impossible to fight. It's always, please, after you, no, you're wonderful, it's all pleasant. Um, and when you get to the very center of the, of the palace, there are, there's a whole new vocabulary reserved for the royal family and the king. So there are three forms of the word to eat, but when you get into the center of the palace, if the king, if you're speaking about the king, there is a fourth word for eating. So, uh, so it registers linguistically, it registers in terms of clothing, you're not allowed to wear shoes. Everyone, the shoes have to stay at that gate right there, you can't bring your shoes in. So the architecture, is more than just buildings, and it's more than just symbolic. Uh, it's actually considered an instrument for reinforcing uh, and producing these sacred flows. Um, and so uh, I've had students look at this uh, more analytically um, over the years. Um, and so here we are. Let's see what happens next in this. So here I am, much younger. And here's my good friend, Gusti Dipo Kusumo, who's the prince in charge of the palace. Um, the costumes that people are wearing are a mixture between the Javanese sarong, uh, Dutch-inspired footwear, uh, a tails coat with medals, a ruffled shirt uh, that are very Dutch, uh, and this blankong, which is very Javanese. And then you see these pith helmets and um, uh, costumes that are, uh, the British had some influence as well. Uh, and you see the architecture, uh, which has a Dutch influence. Here's the tower to the Queen of the South Seas. Um, uh, here's uh, the gold and red ribbon is something that when you pass through one of the gates, uh, from that point forward, you need to wear one of those ribbons as a sign to the Queen of the South Seas that you are a friend of the king's. Uh, you're not an enemy. You, it's almost like um, uh, a visitor badge. Um, but no one checks it but the Queen of the South Seas. Um, and it was a similar thing that all tourists, they, they had this very a uh, humble tour through the palace. Did you ever go on that tour? I also went to one of the oh, did ceremonies you go? of the... Uh, the coronation? The coronation. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Yeah. Did you wear yeah, I was, a yeah. samir? Yeah. Um, at a certain point, while I was there, as they were gearing up for this colonial Williamsburg uh, transformation of the palace, uh, the prince who was in charge of the tours said, Foreigners don't want to be bothered with this mumbo-jumbo religious backwardness. Um, let's tell them they don't have to wear the, the samir, the, the, the ribbon. And my response was, are you kidding? We love that stuff, right? We love that stuff, don't we? Was I, did I get it right? We love that, right? That they actually believe it so much that we are supposed to wear the right thing. We're not allowed to wear shorts. We're not allowed to expose shoulders. Um, that would be rude. Uh, and so uh, they were arguing, we don't want to, we want to accommodate the tourists. And um, since I was the only one around who wasn't Indonesian, I 
it was my job to say, no, foreigners love that. It gives them a taste, gives them a sense that it's still going on. It's, it's invaluable. So here we are uh, doing our studies of this uh, historic building, uh, wearing the ribbons. Uh, uh, and before we do anything, we go through the sacred offerings. Um, the carpenter, Pa Asmo, uh, is also a priest. Uh, he's a master builder and a priest because every cut and every detail of what he's doing to this column uh, has a sacred meaning. It has a functional meaning, meaning like a mortise and a tenon would, um, you know, we have this term mortise and tenon, tongue and groove. Uh, they would have mortise and tenon that would be uh, a symbol, a sacred symbol of the female and, and male genitalia again, and how together they create the entire universe and the terms would be mixed together. The religious terms and the technical terms are all mixed together. And you, so to be a carpenter, you have to be a priest. You said they were intentionally trying to like uh, represent like the genitalia? Um, not from a salacious point of view, but from a sacred. Right, yeah. so what I was gonna say, when you were showing that like aerial view of the uh, temple, mm -hmm. and you were kind of talking about the umbilical cord, mm -hmm. I was thinking, and I don't know if this is gonna be weird, but I thought they it kind of looked more like ovaries. Okay. Like, the, like this over, and I wasn't sure if they were going with the idea of like the thing being more like the belly, like the womb. I will ask them next time I go. Because like it just seemed like, <laughs> it, like if you like had gone to like the, area, the two, be, like the two, even the two like temple yeah. the trees on the side that look like. I don't know. If yeah, like, and they they have the two trees that you pass yeah, between. I don't know. It also, just seemed, it seemed like that. It looked like that, and I was when you mentioned it again mm -hmm. just now. It just maybe was more intentional than I had. Well, it's interesting. Uh, I would run into these problems. I would ask one person, what does this column mean? And he'd say, well, it's eight-sided. Uh, that represents the eight, uh, the eight-year cycle in, in Islam. And the Prophet Muhammad lived eight cycles of eight. So the number eight is sacred in Islam. So that's what the column is all about. You can see the column here. That's why I mention it. Um, and then I would ask someone else just to confirm, because I'm a good researcher. And they would say, well, um, uh, the sac most sacred side is facing east because that's where the sun rises. And in Hinduism, the, the facing east is the important thing. And it's a journey through life, uh, birth, uh, life of suffering and death. Uh, and it goes through these eight stages. And, and, um, and then I would ask a third person. I'd, I would ask my friend Prince Deepo Kusumo, which one is it? And he would say, why do you have to choose? And so there was this attitude that um, I forgive you your Western academic scholarship ways of needing to find the truth, the one single truth. Um, I, for I am patiently forgiving that you have this mental disorder <laughs> of the West. Um, I look forward to the day when you can be at peace with many paths to the ultimate truth, which transcends all of these apparent, the illusion of conflict here on the earth. So um, I think that is part and parcel of the syncretic operation of these things, um, is that many things can be true. And so we saw the Car the priest carpenter in carpenter mode, and here's the priest carpenter in priest mode uh, at the center of the palace. Um, and uh, here's a, a, an obviously Dutch Baroque carriage that was uh, a gift from the queen, the Dutch queen, about 120 years ago. Um, the more this Dutch carriage uh, was used in the palace, the more Javanese it became. Uh, and at a certain point, it was granted a Javanese name, Kyai Garuda Kenchana. And after a certain number of decades, it became so Javanized, which is the word they use, uh, things become Javanese by just being used in these rituals that it became something that they had to give offerings to every Wednesday night, which is a sacred 
time of the week uh, in order to maintain the balance between heaven and earth. So whenever there's a disturbance, a uh, volcano erupts, a uh, famine hits, they uh, perform rituals to restore the balance. Um, here's uh, a, an example of how all these things get mixed up. There's an Ottoman fez, uh, a Dutch brass band, um, the coattails uh, snipped off of these jackets because the prince the prince was going to uh, an event and the king was going to be there. And so he has to wear the Javanese costume. But the, also the Dutch governor general was going to be there too. So you have to wear the Dutch costume. So he had a, a fashion crisis. Uh, he didn't know what to wear to the party. And so he had his dresser um, dress him in his wraparound sarong skirt with the Dutch tail jacket. Um, but you can't wear the, the wraparound skirt without your sword, your kris, your sacred sword, uh, tucked into the waistband in the back. And so when he put on the t tails coat, the tails jutted out in a very awkward and embarrassing manner. And so he told his dresser, snip those tails off. And fashion history was made, and the modern Javanese sacred costume is the result of that syncretic, uh, pragmatic move of mixing the two traditions and adapting them so that they work together uh, to create something that's very new. I'm sorry. Thank you. So I don't know if there's sound. This is the, should be, should the be. Dutch. Um, you're seeing a bunch of stuff here. <coughs> And you should be hearing this horrible music. So this is what the music is supposed to sound like. And this is the ceremony you went to, Hassan. Yeah. So this is the coronation, the coronation ceremony of the king uh, that commemorates the day of his original coronation. Uh, and he climbs the tower. He climbs the tower and he renews the uh, sexual relationship with the Queen of the South Seas, um, who comes to the palace and um, for the event. And so this happens every year to renew the, the eternal bond between the Queen of the South Seas and the king. And it was this king who was in power when you yeah. we went. Uh, the, the ceremony is also part of to honor a bunch of people. And it's the time when Aji Dame was given the... The medal? The medal. So he was given and a title. He was, yeah, he was given a title, and he had to watch up, walk along in his... Uh, you know, bent down... Oh, the, the duck floor, walk that the I think we saw Did you, yeah. earlier. And he wasn't used to doing that, of course. Yeah. So one of the ceremonies they perform is uh, the Javanese New Year, where the priests look at what good and bad things happened in the previous year. And they look at the predictions of what is expected, the good and bad things expected in the coming year. And they, uh, based on that, they try to inoculate and strengthen the realm uh, so that the flow of good fortune continues to flow. And so they select specific sacred items from the treasury and they parade it around the palace. And this is a way of restoring the balance so good fortune will continue to flow through the palace. And it's just one more demonstration that uh, these buildings are not just buildings and they're not just symbols. They're not just monuments to some past glory, some past age. It is right now, in real time, performing a very important function of uh, sustaining the, good, the flow of good fortune. And so ba faced with this evidence, it became increasingly urgent to recognize the ongoing living culture of this associated with this architecture. It's not about the buildings. It's about the larger 
system of cultural forces that the buildings and the architecture serve as vehicles for that, for that, for those living traditions. And so tens of thousands of people come from, they walk into the city from the surrounding countryside and they throng the streets and the sacred white buffalo uh, lead a procession around the palace. When the buffalo stop, the procession stops. When the buffalo keep walking, we all, the thousands of people following, uh, walk. And when the buffalo trot, everybody picks up their skirts and tries to keep up with the buffalo. When the buffalo pee on the, on the streets, the young men leap to soak it up in their sarongs, their family sarongs, so they can take it home. And similarly, when the buffalo does number two. Um, and so all of these things um, give us, take us back to the Issei Shrine. Um, just as it would be unthinkable to dismantle uh, a, a historic building in the United States and rebuild it, that's, that would be actually uh, something uh, frowned upon in the United States. It's the essential element of the tradition in Japan. Uh, similarly, uh, given what is important in this palace in Java, you have to treat it differently than you would treat it uh, as you would in the United States. So you can't do a colonial Williamsburg um, preservation plan uh, as if the same values and priorities exist elsewhere. And um, this is where we get to Regal. Um, uh, so you read Regal, uh, I think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, true. So Regal, uh, I'm going to give you, uh, just for those of you um, who might be rusty on it, Regal, the main takeaway I, I get from Regal <clears throat> is before you do anything, you have to look at the artifact. You have to look at the place. You have to look at the architecture, the building, and you have to determine what's important about it. It could be that it's old. It's age value. It could be that it's uh, exemplary artistic achievement. It's art value. It could be that, um, you know, so all the different values uh, uh, that Regal lists are basically different ways of identifying where, what is the source of value? Why is it that we think this place is special? Uh, and then and only then can you responsibly move forward with a, a preservation plan. Um, when this palace burned to the ground, and you're, we're looking at the center of the palace, same orientation, so you see the tower queen of the, to Queen of the South Seas, and we're looking at the, the, uh, what's left after they take away the charred remains of the most sacred center of the palace. Um, uh, and so uh, something, we have to rebuild it. So the government of Indonesia, the president Suharto of Indonesia, and you weren't there then, were you? Um, in 84? 84. No. I left in, I left in, uh, later, actually I was there later. Okay. I was there in 80 till 80, till the end of 83, I left in 83. Oh, okay. Um, so the president dictator of Indonesia said, well, we can't favor one religion or one sacred house over another. So um, I'm going to donate personally. Uh, and I'm going to direct my cabinet to donate their salaries to the, the reconstruction of the palace. Uh, and so they sent the head of public works into the palace to do what they normally do since wood is so expensive. Uh, who has big trees like that anymore? Let's replicate it in concrete. Well, the engineer came uh, ready to, he's really good at designing steel reinforced concrete replicas of wood buildings. So he's all set to do that. But as he started talking about uh, talking to the royal family, the same thing happened to him that happened to me. He, after a few weeks of talking to people, he said, wait a minute, we're not going to build this in concrete. And we're not going to just come in as outsiders and build it. We're going to 
how often do you get to rebuild a sacred palace like this? We're going to do everything we're supposed to do according to the religion. And so they did. They had offerings, uh, and they, uh, they harvested the trees from the sacred uh, forests, north, south, east, and west, for the main four pillars of the most sacred building. And they did everything right. Um, and uh, at the culmination of my time there in the mid-'90s, um, we finally got a chance to uh, do a similar thing. Uh, the Aga Khan Award for Architecture, the organization that your professor uh, was central to founding and uh, nurturing in its early years, um, asked if they could have their award ceremony in the palace. And um, in return for that favor, they were willing to contribute uh, funding for the restoration of whatever element of the palace would help them have the ceremony. And at my insistence and suggestion, I said, well, we got to ask the king what his priorities are. And so we, he said, this uh, tower to the Queen of the South Seas is um, is sagging a bit. Let's we need to replace those columns, and so that's what we did uh, because we were taking a regal values analysis approach to the preservation. What's important is not necessarily the buildings themselves. What's important is the living tradition, and at the center of the living tradition is the king. Um, even though the king had his own idiosyncrasies of personality, um, he was still also uh, the holder since 1942 of this position of king at the center of the palace. And so we asked him, Your Highness, Your Royal Highness, what would you have us do? And um, this is the area where the award ceremony dinner was held, and so we were fixing that up as well, um, uh, up to uh, a higher standard like this. Um, and I'm going to just show the outcomes. We also did it by employing uh, the local craftspeople uh, who had not worked on the palace for many decades because they were using whatever money they had, and they had very little money. They were using the money to keep the rituals going. Because if they had to choose between the rituals and the architecture, they have no choice. They have to keep the rituals going. And so that was yet another indication that the architecture, sometimes the best thing you can do for the architecture is not make the architecture the most important thing. In order to maintain and sustain the source of the meaning of the architecture, it's important to give other things higher priority. It's counterintuitive, but that's basically what the situation sometimes uh, calls for. And so um, this work proceeded, employing the artisans who had been out of work, uh, or they were working on uh, souvenirs or hotel lobbies, because that was a new thing, is um, decorate hotel lobbies. Uh, one of the things that happened is um, we assembled a team of experts, and uh, I had a hard time controlling them because they were not uh, experts of, even where they were experts from Indonesia. They were trained in the science, uh, the, the 20th century modern science of preservation practice, uh, basically as they inherited it from the West. Uh, Ikram in, in Italy, you know, these standards, the Secretary of the Interior's standards for uh, preservation practice, all of these things. Uh, and so they, were, they came with the presumption that, sure, we know how to do this. You go in, you do paint, you, you, you go down, you decide what is the most important period, uh, what's the most authentic moment of this architecture. You, uh, you expose the paint from that layer, and that's the paint you use. You use that color because that's the most authentic. So you identify in the distant past a reference point of high authenticity, and you, you use that as your guide for, the, uh, for your work. Uh, and um, 
I had to uh, convince them, uh, the outsider, it was ironic, uh, the outsider had to convince them that's a reference point and we will present that to the king and his trusted advisors and we will say this is what uh, the tenth uh, ruler uh, determined to be the proper colors for this pavilion at that high point in 1863. Um, that would be one possible uh, paint color to restore it to. But since you are the king uh, and you are at the center of these living traditions, we will do what you tell us. And he was not used to that because the Japanese would come in, they say, we want to give you money for the library and the, the royal family would say, okay. The Japanese would come in, not say a word to them, fix the library and leave. They wouldn't ask them how to do it or what standards, they would just do it. Cornell came in, they made an air-conditioned library, uh, didn't really talk to them much, and, uh, and one after another were these outsiders coming in and imposing their values and their standards. And so this was kind of a paradigm shift for everyone, where we said, what's important about this palace is the living tradition now, and that's what we'll do. Part of that was um, the craftsman saying, we will repair these cracks using Bondo. Who knows what Bondo is? Is Bondo the right thing to use? No. Why not? It's used for cars. It's used for cars, right? It's extremely rigid. Is it good for repairing wooden buildings? No. Wooden buildings, the wood is harvested, but it's still alive. It moves with temperature and humidity changes, the wood contracts. And I, so I was thinking as a technical person, and I was saying, you can't use Bondo. Uh, and I explained, I'm, I, Amara explained to them uh, that that's a, that's a ridiculous thing to do. Um, and it was a moment of crisis for me because uh, I really, they pushed back very hard. And uh, where I was rehearsing in my mind what it would sound like uh, for me to insist. Listen, I'm the one who brought the Aga Khan here. Uh, I'm the one who has the money. Uh, you do it my way or you don't do it at all. And as I rehearsed that in my brain, I had a spasm of like, I can't say that. That's a betrayal of everything. And so I said, okay. And in my own mind, I was thinking, I'm going to say, I told you so. Well, uh, it turns out they were right uh, that the humidity is so stable, or it was then, now it's anybody's guess. But at the time, um, the humidity was pretty much 90% year round you know, fluctuating between 86 and 96, but very high humidity. So this wood is not moving. Plus, this wood has been here f for 100 years. Uh, so any cellular uh, moisture is long gone. Uh, and so the superficial moisture is pretty constant, right? I don't know if you've studied these technical things. You'll run into it. Um, Turns out, visiting years and years later, uh, turned out great. Bondo, no problem. And so um, you see the Bondo, you see the new columns, you see the finished product. Um, and then a few years later, they decided to, there was one building left that they hadn't replaced after the fire. And so they, they took some of the things that we did for the 95 uh, award ceremony, and they applied them to the construction of this hall. Uh, they harvested the tree. Um, they had a photographer. I wasn't able to take pictures of the previous tree harvesting um, in 84. Um, but uh, here's, uh, basically, the ritual is you wrap a, a cloth around the selected tree, the priest uh, meditates at the tree 24 hours a day. There's a, they take shifts, but there has to be someone meditating at the tree 
night and day for however long it takes before the spirits indicate by some signal that they interpret, okay, it's time. You can have the tree. Because you're asking permission to harvest the sacred tree, which has been growing for uh, you know, over a century to get to this size. And so in a religious ritual, they harvest the tree. Um, they build the hall. The gold nail has to be put in the top of the pillar. This is one of the rituals I didn't really understand. So um, the nail came out of the box um, held by uh, my friend Eddie on the left. And the king is nailing the nail, the gold nail, in the top of one of the sacred pillars. Um, then the last thing I want to present, um, I had the opportunity, um, my ex-girlfriend um, decided to build a performing arts center and a home for her and her husband uh, in Solo, in Suricarta, and called me up uh, to design them a home. And um, they were a little uncomfortable with all the things I was bringing from the palace. But one of the big things I was bringing was uh, I told them right from the start, the house is one thing, uh, but the gardens, uh, just as in the palace, it's the courtyards that are the source of sacredness, the courtyards that represent the oceans in the Hindu cosmological model. <laughs> It's the courtyards that are the most important element of the palace. It's the empty space. Um, and so I said, the most important rooms of your house are going to be the gardens. And the house will be built in a way as to frame those gardens. Uh, so every room will have a, a view onto the gardens. And right before I was doing this, you know, Jeffrey Bawa figured heavily into this whole approach as well. Can I ask a question? Sure. On the left, the windows look like steamy, like an ice glass. Is it because of the humidity, or no. did, did you design that? It's frosted glass. So it's frosted to create, it is to create light, but with privacy. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a home and it's a performing arts center. Um, and so, um, and um, it's unfortunate that she um, doesn't really know how to. Um, take movies without tilting her phone. But this is out in front, so I apologize. This is the rice field out in front. I happened to be in town when they were looking at this land. Uh, they had looked at uh, over a dozen pieces of land, and I was visiting for less than 24 hours. And they, they, they said, we got to go. We have this appointment. And they said, oh, it's to look at land. Why don't you come look at the land? And so I said, OK. And I said, the rice field, you got to buy this piece of land. And so they did. And so I, I was fortunate when I designed this place, um, I had walked the land and knew it. Um, this is before it's finished. There she goes. It's not quite finished yet. Um, but they're already hosting uh, arts group, this arts group from Australia, learning how to play the Javanese gamelan. And they had just arrived. This was their first day, and they were all excited. This is the performing arts part of the house uh, uh, in the front. And there you see the frosted glass dividing the front from the rear. And so this is a sacred pavilion that is 200 years old that uh, we were fortunate to find. This is a connecting piece through what is now the dining room into the kitchen that then gives you the view onto the garden from the inner sanctum of the house. So it is very much like the palace in that there's a more public outward facing area and a more private in, inner place. Um, and so there's students all over this house um, uh, practicing. Here's the bedroom. Uh, and there's the walk-in closet that has become a rehearsal studio for lessons. Um, and um, here's uh, the man of the house who's a world famous drummer. Uh, he just did a tour of the United States, um, performed in the Boston area several nights, just went back to Java on Sunday, as a matter of fact. But um, uh, so he's giving lessons to the Australians. Here you see the living room 
before it's a living room and the view out into the garden. Um, here's the, the garden outside the bedroom. Um, very much uh, in terms of roof form, it's a syncretic uh, combination that has become quite popular in Java between the Dutch and the Javanese. And the door there, uh, so that's the roof of the pavilion. They were lucky uh, to find uh, a 200-year-old uh, pavilion. Pretty much uh, they thought that they were all gone. I originally designed the house to have an open pavilion, which is the sacred center of the Performing Arts Center where you perform these things. Um, there's a river just uh, to the uh, north of the, the property, and I originally planned on the gardens outside the bedroom to slope down to a garden that featured this river and a bamboo grove. Um, but the husband said, no, rivers are the place of death and garbage and, and danger and evil spirits. Um, and it took me a long time to, to, um, be, to come to grips with the fact that you, you can't, uh, you got to go along with these traditions. And so again, it was a crisis moment for me where um, uh, there is a wall there. But you can at least hear the river and the bamboo trees coming over the top. Here's um, part of the uh, salvaged uh, elements from the 200-year-old uh, the uh, open pavilion that was found about 100 miles away in a village. Um, I uh, when I designed the house, I left a big space for if and when they were able to locate a historic pavilion. Um, halfway through construction, they were despondent that they weren't going to be able to find them. They were being told by the expert pavilion hunters. Um, and they were doing that back in the 80s, right? People in Jakarta, yeah. Yeah. Would, they would find yeah. these old structures. Uh, they, they could dismantle them, knock them down, because they're all tongue and groove assembly, um, joinery, and put them on a truck, take them to Jakarta, where wealthy people assembled them in their backyard. Um, uh, and so they were thought to be all gone. And so we started talking to someone who would build one from scratch. But that would cost a fortune because wood is so precious. And then they found one that was much older than uh, almost anything anyone had seen in a decade or so. And so they jumped on it. They got a great price. They took it down, and they built it here. There's the gold nail. Uh, going into the most sacred element of the center beam. There it is being roofed. Um, here it is in use for the gamelan. There's the, um, the opening ceremony last September um, uh, where they have a, a shadow puppet play. There's the puppeteer, my ex-girlfriend, handing him um, the puppet, uh, her husband behind her. Uh, one of the princes from the palaces uh, is the MC, uh, one of my uh, collaborators on the palace restoration. Uh, he helped choose the light fixtures for the palace restoration, and he helped choose the light fixtures for this construction as well. And now he's the MC for the opening ceremony. Uh, a famous painter is doing a live painting during the shadow puppet play to inaugurate this home. Um, and we're back to the beginning. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. So you saw that picture, and it that's what made you want to, or you took this picture? No, that's... This is the picture you saw? That I saw. That made you want to go? She came back with like three pictures, and the others were pictures of people, and she showed me this picture. I said, wow. That's so Do you still speak Italian? <laughs> I forgot. Did you go to Rome? <laughs> I went to Rome for my honeymoon, um, but... Uh, I studied French, uh, and when I and then and I knew it pretty well. And then when I studied Italian, I forgot all my French. I studied Italian for a year at NYU, very intensively. Uh, and then when I went to Hawaii to study Indonesian for a summer, I forgot all my Italian, and I don't speak a word of Italian, like except when I'm trying to speak Spanish. Then it all comes back. <laughs> but now, since then, I've I figured out how to sort, and I I can do. Indonesian, Dutch, and Spanish pretty well. But not Italian. It's gone. 
Someday I'll get it back. But it's interesting, you know, I've given this talk at least a dozen times now, I think. Fair number, maybe not a dozen. And yeah. um, I think I showed last time the house under construction, yeah. so there's some new things every time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Plus, hmm. my uh, flaky software conspires, like I think I gave this in a completely different way than I gave it before. Yeah, it was, it was different. Yeah. yeah. When was the last time you were back in um, well, I go to Bali. I take students to Bali every September, but they're so demanding. I never get to Java. So the last time I was in Java was uh, August 2016. For during the construction, it was midway through the construction, and I was able to uh, coordinate some things. It's very difficult to coordinate because the contractor um, doesn't have a cell phone, doesn't use email doesn't talk to women, oh, my God. or at least they won't look at them because he's a devout Muslim. Um, so there was a lot going against us because um, uh, I was producing drawings and then photographing them or digitizing them and sending them to the clients and they would try to share it with him but s often they would show up in the morning and say here like this. This is, it's, and point to the phone. He would look at it and then he'd build. But fortunately, uh, he was extremely good. And um, before I was an architect, I was a builder. And then I uh, was an engineer. I went to engineering school and dropped out. And then at the palace, I had an obsession with building techniques and how they actually construct these things. So I was able to draw it in a way that predicted pretty accurately how he would normally build whatever he builds. So I wasn't doing the crazy Western architect thing that even happens here where um, architects don't let uh, the need to build it in physical material reality interfere with the architect's creativity. Um, I didn't have that going on. I was anticipating how he would build things. Uh, the clients were very sensitive about cost. They weren't borrowing any money to do this. And if the building cost too much, they wouldn't be able to build the, they wouldn't be able to purchase the traditional pavilion that they were looking for. So we kept it really cheap, minimized the use of wood. Uh, and I, basically my job was to not ask them to do anything that they wouldn't normally do in any of their projects. Um, I, my degree of freedom had to do with the configurations and dimensions, but not methods of assembly or materials. Um, so it, I, it was, it, it came out very close to the way I conceived it. Um, very lucky in many ways. When you were working on the Kraton, mm -hmm. and the king would say, or you'd go to the king and say, yeah, make the, the decision. Mm -hmm. You'd take him something, show him something, but he'd make Was there ever a time when you had to try and actually, or were you tried to persuade him to your point of view, in terms of when he made some decisions of, let's paint it pink, or he didn't say that, but anyway. Uh, or did you, or did you just said no? This is it, because of what it you was, believe. It was the opposite. Well, I could have been passive aggressive, and that would have, uh, and I probably was, because that's the normal. That's the thing they're used to is you don't ask them at all. Um, but I did my best to not do that. Um, as a matter of fact, I was trying to win him over to take responsibility for what we were doing, because uh, I was committed to not. You know, I was very critical of those who would come before us, where um, they would come in to help out and fix the palace, and they would leave the buildings in better shape, but in the process, the way they did it, they would reduce the capacity of the palace to take care of their own business. So they would actually reinforce uh, the story that uh, you used to run the whole country, now look at you. You're incompetent. You can't even manage your own affairs. 
uh, why don't you just move out and turn it over to the tourism industry? Um, that was the story that a lot of people coming in were reinforcing well, the, for that. The king had lost political power, right? But he had he lost still, political power. But he still had this he still, embodiment of the religious... He was religious. still in charge of all the religious aspects. And that's what little money they had. It was uh, businessmen who wanted to curry favor from the gods. And so they would give him money to perform a ritual, um, not improve a building. Um, and so they were used to people like me showing up and uh, reducing, and talking down to them and reducing their the respect. And I was committed to reversing that. That I would say to the king and uh, everyone in the project, um, building schmilding, let the whole thing fall to the ground. The important structures of this palace are the living religious cultural traditions. Let's reinforce those. Let's use the restoration of the palace as a means to, to buttress and reinforce and strengthen and reinvigorate these religious uh, human institutions. Because as soon as uh, the prior, you know, they fixed up the library and people left, and then the library, what happens in the tropics, you know, just because no one's taking care of it because it's not theirs. They don't own it. Um, but it was really gratifying to see a few years later um, they had ownership of everything we had done. And they uh, kept it going and they built upon it. They, they actually did more. They felt like, okay, we can do this. And they started, they rebuilt the dining hall. And they didn't do everything I would have done. They actually turned over a lot of authority to the contractor in that case. And I, I focused on that in previous versions of this lecture. But, um, but for the most part, <clears throat> there was a sense of this is a turning point. We're going uh, we're gonna to make, we, we've been on the world stage now. Uh, BBC covered the awards ceremony. And they were on international television. Uh, and that they said, this is a turning point. We're back. We're back on the world stage, like we were uh, during the Dutch era. So most of my work was convincing the king that uh, if he said pink, we'll do pink. Uh, we hope he doesn't say pink. Here's the blue that uh, was used in 1863, but it's up to you. It's your decision. Uh, and it was a hard. It was a hard sell because he was perfectly happy to say, who am I, you know, like a Jewish mother, who am I, I'm just the king, <laughs> go ahead, walk all over me. And they still reside there today? They do. Okay. There's been, um, he was very sloppy about uh, indicating who his successor would be, so there was a big soap opera, royal family, struggle for power and you know armed barricades and uh, very exciting stuff um, and uh, they work it out they worked it out after a fashion I mean it was really it's basically coming to grips with the fact that um, they've locked the doors they've changed the, the locks and yeah. they're not budging um, tough luck let's move on very sad and very difficult for a lot of people. But it continues. The faction where the son-in-law, the, the brother-in-law of the current king is Eddie, who's a contractor, and he's got very dubious taste, and he likes to do things cheaply and with shiny bathroom tile. And I try to talk him out of doing these things, but um, um, and he's just doing it. He's not asking his brother-in-law, the king, what he wants. Uh, he's just doing it, um, which is unfortunate. But we had our moment. <laughs> but I think the real takeaway here is, is um, this is an extreme uh, demonstration uh, of, of sticking with the rules of of figure out what's valuable and make sure 
that you are reinforcing those things that are the source of the value. Uh, because if you just blindly uh, do what it says in the Venice Charter, or if you just do what you were taught uh, about the in Secretary of the Interior guidelines, there's a good chance you're going to get it wrong or not entirely right. If you're doing it in, in Newport, you know, where these rules were written based on that material, you're going to be okay. But if you're going to um, some of the First Nation sites or if you're uh, going to Foxwoods, you know, where there are people alive still who are Wampanoag and, and Massasoit and all these peoples are still around. If you're not talking to them about their heritage, then you're running the risk of getting it uh, not just not as good as it could be, but dead wrong. And you actually could end up doing more harm than good as my predecessors at the palace did. So I had no idea uh, that Regal was saying these things because I did all this, I said, my job here is done, and then I went to uh, sit in Hassan's class, like you are. And it was only then that Hassan and Akash, his co-instructor, said, you guys should read Regal. And I said, ah, that's what we were doing. That's why we were doing it. <laughs> and so it's retrospectively, we're understanding that this was a case of identifying the values and priorities of what makes this place special and then acting accordingly. And that really deserves to be uh, at the heart of the code of ethics for historic preservation moving forward. And you've studied the Nara Charter? No, we haven't come, we're coming to the Charter soon. We haven't come to them yet. So you will study the yeah. Nara Charter, yeah. which is uh, a set of guidelines. So, if the interior secretary of the interior guidelines, which you have studied, well, they've done it in another class. Not okay. This particular. One. So, if the secretary of the interior guidelines come out of Newport, Rhode Island, and places like that, Mount Vernon, etc., Colonial Williamsburg, the Nara Charter comes out of the Issei Shrine. So, it would be interesting for you to look at. If you're looking at these cases, you end up with these principles. If you look at other cases, you end up with principles mm. that are totally in violation of, of uh, the, other, the, the first principles. And so now what? The answer is regal. You look to those guidelines, you identify where the values lie, act accordingly. So. This is to say that all of you, would you please read Regal again if you haven't? Remind yourself of Regal. It was in the reading last when you were reading Michelle's stuff as well. So, so anyway, thank you. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. Thank you. Very other nice. questions? Good. Yeah, are there any other questions? Otherwise, we'll let Bob go in a few minutes. Okay. All right. Thanks thank very much. Great. Great. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. We'll take a final